five, we've only got one more part after this of our little series that we've done. It's just going through some of the basics of what we believe. We've left Paul with the easy subject next week of resurrection and all those sort of things and heaven and all sorts of things. It's going to be an incredible time. So I'm looking forward to learning something next week from Paul. Um, but I've got left with the, this week five. I'm excited to be sharing about the, the ministry and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's, it, I, I was talking in our office the other day as we were just talking through some of the things uh, that we've been going through. Uh, and, and I've really wrestled and struggled with some of the sort of stuff that we've done because it's not my normal journey of preparing a message or anything. And I've had to sort of do things a little differently. And I've, I've really struggled. And you may have noticed sometimes that I've preached. I've struggled. It's not my natural sort of uh, run to try and get into uh, of how I preach. Uh, but I'm so grateful for, for this. And I hope you've had something out of it so far. I hope today you're going to just get something as well. Um, as, as, as again, I sort of get a few thoughts out of a message and then I start looking and going deeper and then God takes me in another direction. Uh, not quite where I thought I was going to go. And that's where we're going to go today as we look at this. Um, so the Holy Spirit uh, is mentioned all the way through from the beginning to the very end. Uh, we've mentioned him on the first week when we talked about God and the one tri triune God or whatever we would like to call him, the three in one God. Uh, and he's mentioned right there from the very beginning. In Genesis 1, verse 2, it says this, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So right at the very start, in the very second verse of the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit doing something and working. And I'm not going to go into all the details of Old Testament stuff. I just want to just give you one quick example uh, before we really move on with the message of, of how the Holy Spirit might have worked, uh, certainly through the Old Testament. Just as an example, you can't put him in a box and try and explain it exactly. Uh, but as an example of what the Holy Spirit did, we're just going to look very quickly at Sam life and three verses uh, from Judges uh, about, how, and it gives us an example of how the Holy Spirit worked right back in the Old Testament. In Judges 13, 25, so Samson, this God, the man of God who had an anointing upon him for a certain time, uh, and it says in Judges 13, 25, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him, this is Samson, while he lived in Mahanadan, which is located near the towns of Zorah and Eshterhol. So here we have Samson, this amazing man of God, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Spirit is beginning to stir him and move him on. And then in chapter 14 and 19, he says this, when the Spirit of the Lord, again talking about Samson, came powerfully upon him, and he went down to the town of Ashkelon and killed 30 men, took their belongings, gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. But Samson was furious about what happened, and he went back home to live with his father and mother. And then Judges 15, 14, again, something similar. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, but the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. And he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. So just as a real sort of a little tiny introduction, the Holy Spirit's been, always been around, always been working. And in the Old Testament, it, would, it seems generally, and again, not, it's not exclusive, but it would generally come upon for people for a specific time to do a specific thing at that moment in time. That's generally how it happened in the Old Testament. Um, but he's always been there. And he's always been doing his thing. And I want to look at three things today. I thought this morning I'd make this little line for you to cheer you up. This is a special sermon for me today because I've got three points, just like Wolverhampton Wanderers did yesterday, which is quite a miracle in itself. So there's a little joke for your football fans there. First time we've had three points for about six months, which is very exciting. Anyway, so I've got a three-point sermon for you today. Uh, we're going to follow that along and see where we go. So this is what we're going to look at. These are the three things we're going to look at today. We're going to look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, because when Jesus spoke about him, it tells us a little bit of who he is and what he is like. Then we're going to look at what happened on the day of Pentecost when we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to look at that and, and, and ask some questions about how relevant that is for you today and for me. And then we're going to look at what Paul teaches about the Holy Spirit, and particularly when he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they operate in the church, or what they are and what they're for. And if we get through that in half an hour, the day of miracles is not yet past. Hallelujah. So we're excited about that, but there's lots to get through today, so we must press on. And I'm literally just going to touch on all of these things. I want you to dig in deeper this. If you 
if I've do- answered your question, I'm not here to answer all your questions today. I'm here to make you see something, to want you to dig deeper, to find out the thing that the Holy Spirit has for you, and he wants to work out in your life, not for you to say, oh, I've got the answer to that now. That's not what I'm here for today. I'm here for you to get hungry, like we talked about today, and dig deeper for everything that God has for you. Are you ready for that? Fantastic. Okay, so let's look. Let's look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and I get most of this is from John chapter 14 to 16, an incredibly important uh, passage in, in John's gospel as Jesus sort of prepares himself uh, to, to go to the cross and he's preparing the disciples for what happens after him. And these three chapters are so, so important. If you've got a red letter Bible where Jesus' words are in red, this is probably the biggest section that you have that is red without much else in between. And it's really, really important. So it's just before Jesus goes to the cross, he needs to impart such incredible revelation to the disciples so it prepares them for life without his physical body on the earth. And so we're just going to look at that right now. So we're going to read just a couple of verses. And I, I can't read all the things we need to read. So there's lots of verses going to come up that you really, if you really want to dig into this, you need to take them home and read them uh, and do that uh, outside of this time this morning. But I want to read from John 14, verse 16 and 17 to start with. And this is what Jesus says as he's talking to his followers. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit. He leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So Jesus here at this stage, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He gives him the Greek word parakletos is the word that he uses. Um, And you'll find that not just uses it here in this passage, he uses it in John 14, 16, we've just read. He also uses it in verse 26 and in chapter 15, verse 26, and also in chapter 16 and verse 7. He uses this term uh, that your translation may translate it in many different ways. You might have the it might be the mighty counselor, he could be the comforter, he could be the encourager. The translation I use, which is the New Living Translation, uses him as advocate. And you might think, why do we need all these different words? Well, some of those words, even when the Bible was translated hundreds of years ago, meant something different than they do today. The word counselor, for instance, would have a different meaning probably than it would even 50 years ago to what it does today. And some of them don't quite express what it means in our culture even and our time right now. And so I personally like the word advocate. Uh, this word parakletos is very often used when you look in Greek literature. It used is as a legal term, as this advocate, someone that comes and stands alongside and, and bridges that gap that, that sort of supports someone in that role. And it literally means called alongside. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is describing him as being called alongside. And that's so, so important. We have to have a grasp of this at the very term. And Jesus uses this specifically because he wants to give us a picture of the nature of the Holy Spirit. At this stage, he's just introducing him, really, and what he's, who he is going to be and what he's going to do. And he wants to introduce his nature as well as the role and all the things that he's going to do. And we're going to look at those, some of the roles that Jesus talks about in a minute. But before we look at all that stuff, before we look at what he can do for you, and before we can look at the power stuff that we get excited about with Pentecost and all of those gifts and those things, it's really important that we need to know his nature. We need to understand who Holy Spirit is before we go after all the stuff that he has and he wants for us. You see, there's too many people that are attracted to a sign. Jesus actually talks specifically. He says, you, you keep wanting a sign. And when he was talking to the religious people and different people around at his time, he says, you're looking for a sign and I'll give you a sign, he says, uh, but it's not the sign you're looking for. He says, because you're just, you're looking for the wrong thing if you're looking for a sign. And too often, we as a people today, we look for signs instead of looking for the real thing that is Jesus. And we miss the significance of Holy Spirit because we're so focused on the signs and the things that come with it. You see, we need to understand the Holy Spirit is a he. 
He's personal. He has a personality. And we need to get to know him rather than just all that he has and he can do. In verse 17, Jesus uses that word so often. He says he, him, his, he constantly. He's, re, he's, re sort of, he's putting it over very clearly that he is a he, not an it. Uh, and I just want to point out this morning, as I've just looked at this, uh, even this week, uh, and I've asked questions myself and I've looked at it, I haven't got this all together. Don't think I'm standing here fully understanding everything that there is to do with the Holy Spirit and all he does, because I, I, it just blows my mind. And just when I think I've got a bit of an understanding of something, I read and I look a bit deeper and I think, oh, wow, that's thrown another thing that I can't quite work out yet. But that's great because that means he's God. Because if I did work it all out, he wouldn't be God. God, the Holy Spirit is God in the same respect that I can't put it all together and put it in a box because then he wouldn't be God. And so he's so big, so massive that we want to dig deeper and find more about it, but you'll never fully get to the bottom of it all because otherwise he isn't God. And so we dig and we dig and we get more and more understanding. But guess what? As you dig deeper and deeper, you find there's more and more and more. And it throws up so many more questions, but it builds your relationship and your faith in him more than ever. It's so, so important to do that. It's the part of him that is mystery that never gets solved until we get to see him face to face. And it's exciting to be a part of that. I got so excited in the first thing, I need a drink already that I was hoping to get at least halfway through. Okay, so we've told he's a he, and it's so important to find that. And then in verse 17, the, the end of verse 17, he says something that is really, really important. He says this, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So Jesus is saying he's with you right now, but later he's be in you. And, and I'll be honest, this I could have had weeks and weeks just trying to get my head into this because I thought I understood something and then you dig and then you think, oh, right, that could be a load of other things. So I'm just giving you my thoughts on what maybe Jesus is saying here. Uh, and this is where I came out with, and you may disagree, and that's fine. I still love you anyway. Um, and so he says this. First of all, he says, we need to know him. So that means we can know him. And he says, you will know him and recognize him because now he lives with you. So I think Jesus is talking about two things particularly there that he's trying to put across. You see, I believe the Holy Spirit was fully seen in Jesus. He dwelled in him. He was fully seen in him. The only person really that has fully expressed Holy Spirit when he came and he dwelt within Jesus. And because all the disciples and all the followers had been with him for three years or so, whatever it would be, they'd sat with him. So in a sense, they'd seen Holy Spirit and what he is like by watching Jesus by being with him, by spending time with him, they'd seen something of Holy Spirit living with them as Jesus expressed what he was like. And so he'd lived with them. But in another sense also, I believe, Jesus is saying that, that, that God, through his Holy Spirit, is everywhere at all times, in every place. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Now, that it, can't do that just in a single human body. It needs to be bigger than that, and it's all around. And that's how God exists in the whole of the world, all over the universe, in his presence through his Holy Spirit. He's everywhere. So in the same verse, he's saying, he's saying that he is everywhere. You've seen him. He's been with us. You've seen him through me, and he's with you through me. But he also says something that the world does not recognize him. So if God is everywhere, why doesn't the world recognize him? And again, these throws up so many questions that I haven't got all of the answers for. But that Jesus was saying, you can know him. You can recognize him. So anyone that says, I don't see God around in place, it's just because they don't recognize him yet. Yeah? It's not that he isn't there. And so God says, in this, Jesus says in this way, the Holy Spirit is with you right now. He's been with you for a while. But then he says this. He says, he will be in you. So he's been with you. He's around you. He's everywhere in those places. But there's a time coming when he's going to be in you, which is more than just being with you. Have you confused yet? Because I've confused myself. You see, following Jesus' death and his consequent resurrection and his ascension into heaven, 
through all of that stuff that Jesus did, I believe Holy Spirit can come and dwell and reside and live within us. He's not just around us anymore. He is now in us. And he's doing whatever God wants to do in us if we will let him and through us by him being in us if we allow him the full access that he wants. So I'm not going to go much further because I could go hours and hours and we're not. But I just want to look at some of the roles, some of the things, again, which gives us a picture of who Holy Spirit is, what he does. Because we need to learn to recognize him. We need to learn to see where, where he is and where he's at work in our lives and around us as well, in other people. And so we need to see some of the roles that he plays. And in just in these three, a few verses in these chapters, Jesus actually speaks of some of the roles Holy Spirit plays. And, and again, I'm sorry, I just haven't got time to read all of these, but please do read them when you get home. We've already read verse 17. And, and one of the things he says there is that he leads us into truth. Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. It's really important that you grasp a hold of that because truth is vital in all of this and spirit holy spirit will lead you into truth we see in verse 26 of john 24 of john 14 also that he teaches us i need teaching a lot and much as i love teaching through the bible and through different things when spirit of the holy spirit is in us he can teach us as well to another level that is beyond even that so holy spirit will teach us and then in verse 26 as well he also says that he reminds us you see i've got taught quite a lot of things but guess what I'm even better at forgetting them than I am about learning them and I need Holy Spirit in me to remind me of those things and I, and if I hope I'm not the only one but I need him and I can remember moments in my life where suddenly something is brought to my mind and it's a memory of something and Holy Spirit that's him working in me reminding me of something maybe something he said something I've learned something I've read he reminds us of certain things in chapter 15 26 Jesus said that he testifies that means he bears witness to himself he speaks up for God through you inside of you he allows himself to speak up for God himself in chapter 16 and verse 8 it says that he convicts us the Holy Spirit convicts us and this is very very important and I think there's something in what I'm going to say now that is really important for someone in this room or maybe someone listening at home. Because he says he convicts us of three things. He says he convicts the world of sin, first of all. And then he says he convicts us of God's righteousness. And then he convicts us also of the coming judgment. And you think, oh, wow, that, that's, that's quite interesting. But you see, without the Holy Spirit convicting you of these things, you cannot become a Christian. You cannot become a Christian if you've never been convicted of these things. And sometimes we get to this point of thinking, oh, where am I exactly in my walk? I've, I, and, and lots of people will come and say, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. I seem to have done the right things, but I don't know. Here are three really good signs if you're worried about whether you're a Christian or not. If you have experienced this, there's a good sign. It's not just all of this. There's more to it than that. But if you have been convicted of sin in the first place, that's a good sign that you are a Christian if you've done something about it. If you are actually has been convicted of God's righteousness and the only way you can get to him is not through you being right because he's too right but because of what Jesus did on the cross and his righteousness that you can carry if you've been convicted of that then that's a good sign that you're a Christian today and if you are convicted that one day you will have to stand before him in coming judgment let me tell you it's only the Holy Spirit that can reveal that to you and that is a sign that one of the signs that maybe you are saved and so we have this so much uncertainty, but the Holy Spirit convicts us of these things and you cannot come to him. The Bible says, unless the Spirit leads you, opens your eyes to see the truth. It's so important that he lets you, convict you of all of those things. And then it says in verse chapter 16, verse 13, he says he will guide you into all truth. I need guidance. Anyone else need guidance in, my, in their life? I need guidance every day, every moment. And Holy Spirit in you can guide you through every step and every way you wake. And then for, in verse 13, he also says he speaks what God says. The Holy Spirit helps us to be able to communicate with God by speaking inside of you. And it's not something you can explain and just put there, but you know Holy Spirit is communicating through God himself into you, into your life, and speaking into you. And then finally, this is the last thing. Verse 14. It's very, very important. Now, I'm going to read this verse. It says this. In John, John 16, we haven't got it on the screen, but this is what it says. In John 16, 14, he says, He, this is Jesus talking, remember, He will bring me glory 
by telling you whatever receives but receives from me. The Holy Spirit will always bring glory to Jesus. And that's so important that we grasp that. Because anything that happens in your life that you're a little bit sure of, or in somebody else's life, if it isn't bringing glory to Jesus, it probably isn't the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we know that and see that because everything he does will bring glory to Jesus. It won't bring glory to you. It won't bring glory to me. It'll bring glory to Jesus Christ. It will put more weight on his name and who he is than what any human being is. And that is so, so important. So these roles help us to see a little bit of who Holy Spirit is, what he's like, and also what he isn't like. So that's Jesus' teaching. So we invite Jesus into our lives. We become a Christian, and we trust in him. We trust in him. We talked about that a few weeks ago, uh, and the sort of the journey of becoming a Christian and salvation and what that means, uh, and the trust in his death and his resurrection and all that he's done. Um, and then he comes, and it's, we sort of talk about it just in a, a sort of odd phrase that we, we don't really know what it means. And it comes, and he comes, and he lives in us. Do you remember a few weeks ago we had the tent that got demolished quite quickly after the service was finished with teddy bears walking around the room as well? Well, well when that tent, we talked about that being the sort of our, our physical body. Uh, and so Holy Spirit, if you like, if it gives you another illustration, he comes and he dwells in that tent that is you. But if he comes into your tent, if he comes into your house, if he comes into your life, let me tell you, he'll want to make some changes. Just as if you bought a brand new house, you would want to just sit there and think, oh, this is exactly what I wanted. You'd find some bits. It might be little things. It might be big things. But you would want to put your own mark on it. Let me tell you, when Holy Spirit comes and lives in your life, he'll want to make some changes. He won't just be happy saying, oh, yeah, you've got everything perfect. Well done. He'll make some changes in your life if you'll let him. And it's so, so important that we get a grasp of that. Because that is another sign that you are saved. Another sign that you think is that you allow Holy Spirit that is living inside of you to challenge you on some stuff that actually God probably isn't happy with. And he wants to do it. Now, he doesn't do it all at once and say, right, I'll throw all of this out. because it's all. He very often and very lovingly and graciously just keeps poking and prodding. Some stuff straight away he might get rid of. And other stuff he'll wait, right, I'll wait for the right moment. Right, now's the time. And Holy Spirit will poke and he'll prod because he's not happy with just, he can't just dwell in this place where the stuff that isn't pleasing and glorifying to Jesus. So that's the sort of, the, the, the description quickly of Holy Spirit that Jesus gives. The second thing I want to look at real quickly, <laughs> real quickly, I keep saying real quickly. Um, maybe you'll think it's going quickly if I keep saying it. Um, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, let's look at this moment. So there's this moment where Jesus has gone, he's, he's, or he's getting ready to go. Uh, and, and this moment in history changes everything. Just as Jesus died and resurrected, it was a moment. But like suddenly, this moment, everything didn't almost change at that moment on the face of the earth, certainly in the disciples' life. They'd seen this incredible stuff, but, but stuff wasn't happening. The church wasn't growing. It was, it was sort of very small. Living. If, if you can fit a church of the whole world in one room, it's not very big. Uh, so that's where the disciples were at this stage. Um, and before Jesus left the earth, he said some incredible things that are so important, just as it was for them, and it is for us today. So let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5. So this is Jesus. He's been resurrected. He's met the disciples quite a few times, and he's just beginning to speak to them a few other times now. Acts 1, 4, 5 says this. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with holy, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus speaks to his followers and he says, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And just as in water baptism, but water baptism, as we do water baptism here, we submerge, you get completely covered in water. If you don't, we'll push you down again, uh, just in case you were wondering about it. Uh, it's really important. Uh, so it's completely all over you. Uh, and, and, and there's that moment of understanding what baptizing means. It means it's that submersion. It's completely covered. Uh, and that's what it's about. And I don't know if you realize, but we are actually already 50 to 60% part water. I read this and I discovered it. So that's exciting. That's why I constantly want to go to the toilet, I assume. Um, but 50 to 60% of you is water already. That's inside you. 
And then when we get baptized, you're covered again with everything. And, and that's what it's about. My explanation for, for sort of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when it uses the word baptized, what does it mean? It means, yes, the Spirit, which is what is living inside of you as the tent. But when this experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit comes around, that he's, he's, he's still poking things around in your life. Inside of you, Holy Spirit is living and he's, he's, he's making you aware of stuff that needs to change and changing things in your life, but then suddenly it doesn't fill everything. It will fill everything in your life, but I, if I really want to live as God wants me to live, I need something more than just that little bit. I need his power in my life. Those little bits of things he's poking at, I cannot do it on my own. Those changes he's asking me to make, I can't do it on my own. I need his help and I need his power. And that's the power that Jesus promised to his disciples. Acts 1 verse 8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, there's some people that don't believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for, for us today. They believe it was just for that time or for certain times in history. Um, and I'm not here to argue with anyone, that whether you're a cessationalist or anything else. That's not it. But I will tell you my view. My view is this. The Great Commission that Jesus said is still relevant for me. The Great Commission that we need to go into Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and all the parts of the earth. I don't believe that died with the disciples. I believe that's relevant for every single one. Otherwise, when we get saved, let's just go to heaven and let's not hang around any longer. And so the Great Commission, I believe, is for us. And so if that's true, the Great Commission stands for us that we need to go, then surely, surely the next bit's true for us as well. Because if these people that had spent three years living with Jesus, learning everything he had, if they need the power, let me tell you, I need the power more than them. If I'm going to fulfill the great commission for my life, going wherever that takes me, I need the power exactly the same as they did. It better not have stopped, otherwise I've got no hope. Whatever your thoughts on cessationalism, I need it. You might not. Well done for you. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life every single day. And I want you to understand that today. Fantastic. Okay, so what happened? Let's have a look. So Jesus had ascended. He'd sat with them. He'd done this. He'd gone back to heaven. And then Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, we get this. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get through it. We'll get there. Don't worry. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where, where they were sitting. Then they, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So this isn't very theological language, but I think the Holy Spirit exploded all over them. I think this moment of Holy Spirit in them suddenly became so much more and it was absolutely all over it. And it was evidence. We see the evidence of there and then, whether you believe the initial evidence has to be now or not. The initial evidence here or there was speaking in tongues. That's quite clear. But it does, I'm not having an argument about whether that's initial evidence every day. I'm not too worried about that, to be honest. And we're certainly not going to dig into it today. But then what happened after that was Peter preached with incredible boldness. And at least 3,000 people got saved. He'd had a new revelation of truth. The truth that Jesus had been teaching him and teaching him and teaching him. The Holy Spirit had suddenly, I believe, opened his eyes to put it all together. And that gave him a boldness to speak out exactly everything that he'd already do. This thing was bubbling up inside of him, but Holy Spirit comes on him, it changes him, and it has to come out of him rather than just sit inside of him. You see, throughout, and you might think, oh, well, it's people that say that that was only just a one-off moment. Well, actually, throughout the early church, this has happened so often. There's other examples in Acts 4.31, Acts 8, 16 to 17, Acts 9, 17 to 18, Acts 10, 44 to 46, and to Acts 19, 5 to 7. You won't have had time to write that down. Oh, they're all up there. Look for you. Fantastic. So in each of these circumstances, something similar happened. Not always the same. Something slightly different quite often, and different experiences happened. But the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit was coming on 
around people and changing and transforming lives. Slightly different in almost all of them in different ways and different styles, but the Holy Spirit and the power of him was coming on people to change their lives. So what about today? I'm nearly there. Don't worry, I've only got two pages left. Three pages left, sorry. <laughs> Mustn't lie. <laughs> So what's Paul's teaching? Very quickly, I'll fly through this and we will get done before it's too late. Okay, Paul's teaching. So we've, we've done Jesus, what he said. We've seen the encounter, what happened on the day of Pentecost. So what is Paul's teaching on this? For us today as the church that we take in, especially as we look at the gift of the Spirit, and we really aren't going to be able to dig in it. But the, chance, the reality is there's a huge amount of questions. I ask myself so many questions. Uh, there's some questions that I'm not even going to start asking because I might start talking about it. So we won't. But there's lots of lots of questions that come up. Uh, and I want to tell you, like I've said before, I don't have all the answers. Some of them I think I do, and then something else happens, and I realize I don't. Some of them I think I don't, and something happens, and I realize probably I did. And that's my experience, and that's where I am at. But part of God in this is all of his mystery that the Holy Spirit doesn't fit in a nice little box that we could put in our bag and take with us wherever we go. He's way bigger than all of that. And experience, I believe, and again, this is difficult to explain, but experience is an important part of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, experience is a part of that. Now, it can't be all of that because you've got to back it up with the Bible and everything else. It's got to be a part of it. But experience is an important part of that. But it must be backed up also with what the Bible says as well. So I'm just going to give you a real quick summary of some of the practical things regarding gifts that Paul talks about. And again, I haven't got time to read all the passages, but I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 12 right through to 14 if you get time uh, sometime today over the, over the next week. And there's some other passages you should ring as well. Uh, and it might answer your questions. Some of you will come to me probably after this and ask me some questions. Well, actually, Paul sometimes gives us the answers. And then what we do is we can't be bothered to look, so we go and ask someone else. I believe God wants you to look yourself and then ask someone out to help you with. I want to encourage you to do that. The answers, a lot of them are in there. Dig a bit deeper and bring some people with you and bring them on that journey. Absolutely. But uh, don't do that because guess what? As I read those verses, yeah, God showed me some answers, but he also asked me some questions that I've not asked before. Uh, And so it's a really important challenge. So 1 Corinthians 12, are you still with me? Fantastic. Uh, Verses 8 to 11, this is what it says. I've got a lot of verses. Look, I need to keep turning the paper. So this is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So let's go through them real quickly, and I mean very quickly, what he just mentioned here. So there's wisdom, this incredible gift of knowing something that is way beyond human knowledge. Words of knowledge, which is a moment of revealing something to your faith, which is to believe for something great. Healing, this is the only one I'm going to speak for more than a couple of words on. It's so important as we pray for healing. Healing something that we hunger for, that we thirst for, we want to see more and more of in the church. And we get it, but it comes with a little danger as well. We have to be so careful if someone especially has a gift of healing that we don't suddenly fix our eyes on a person. The healing comes from Almighty God himself. And someone may have a gift, but guess what they're doing the healing? It's Almighty God. It's Holy Spirit inside of him. And so I just want to encourage you as you begin to look. And I I want to see people all over this place operating in all of the gifts, including healing. But don't fix your eyes on any person. Fix your eyes on Almighty God. Fix your eyes on the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings healing, and he might use people to do it. And this is the thing I would throw Sometimes you might have your eyes fixed on a person, and you might miss the person that actually God decided for you to pray for that would bring you healing, but your eyes were fixed on a person. So just be very, very careful. Be very, very wise in all of that. Now, there are times that I've certainly sensed myself that a certain person is the right person to pray for someone. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But what I'm saying is just don't look to the person. What, however great and whatever their gifting is, don't look to them. Look 
to Almighty God. Okay, that's enough on that one. Miracles are the incredible thing that goes outside of all the physical natures of, of what humanity is. Prophecy, which usually means speaking the word. Discernment of spirits, the sort of being able to distinguish whether something is from God, the spirit of him or not. Tongues, which you'll have heard talked about and you'll have heard taking place in this place where it's a different language. And then interpretation of tongues when someone brings one and they interpret that and what that means. I haven't got a chance to go into all of those. Please forgive me today. And, and that's not an exclusive lift. There's more mentioned in chapter in verses 28 to 30 in this chapter. There's more gifts mentioned in Romans 12, 7 to 8. And there's more gifts mentioned in Ephesians 4, 7 to 13 as well. So go and dig into those in your own time. Um, and so we haven't got time to look at them, but I, we're happy to talk to people. If you want to ask more questions, please do do that. We just don't have the time to do that today. But I encourage you to read for yourself, dig for yourself, look for yourself, as well as ask other people as well. Don't become a lazy and just say, can you answer this question? God wants you to find it out. And part of the digging and learning is the journey of knowing God himself. So the overall view of gifts, this is what I want to leave you with. So that's a good sign. It means I'm nearly done when I say this is what I want to leave you with. The overall view of gifts and what it means, I want, I, this is the focus I want you to leave from today. I don't want you to go from here thinking, I want to be a healer. Want, uh, that, that's not where I want you to go. Chapter 12, verse 4 to 7 says this. These are, this is Paul speaking just before what he said there. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but the ser they serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but in the same God who is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of each of us so we can help each other. You see, the previous verses to all of this uh, is, is quite interesting, uh, but it, Paul is obviously sort of dealing with some stuff that's calling, causing division in the church. People are sort of falling out over certain things. And then he goes into this talk about gifts. Uh, and, and actually, the next part of this sort of chapter talks about the church. Charlotte touched on it last week and did a great job of talking about the body and what it means and how important it is to work together. All in this chapter, he talks about gifts and he talks about unity. And these verses speak of, he says, the same spirit, but different gifts. He says, the same Lord, but different service. He says, the same God, but different ways. He's talking about a diversity of all of that. But inside that diversity, an incredible unity that should come together. And then verse 2, 7 tells us, verse 7, sorry, tells us too, something really important. First of all, it tells us that every, there is a gift for everyone, at least one gift. Now, some of you may have seven or eight gifts or even more, but that everyone has a gift that God wants to give us. But more importantly, even than that, is the purpose. The purpose in verse 7, God says, Jesus, uh, Paul says, is a spiritual gift given each so we can help each other. You see, the purpose of the gift is vitally important for us to grasp. Um, you need to ask why you want the gift. I have people come to me sometimes that say, oh, I want to do this, I want to do this. Well, you need to ask yourself why you want it. And if your reason for wanting it isn't so that it helps each other, then don't expect God to give you the gifts. Because that's what Paul's telling us the gifts are for, for helping each other in this place, in the church. We need to seek the gift, the giver, not the gifts. There's a really in interesting passage in Acts chapter 8 where Simon the sorcerer definitely becomes a Christian because Peter tells us about it, but then suddenly says, I, I want to buy that, I want to chase that gift as the apostles are doing some incredible stuff. And, and Peter has to sort of chastise him and say, how dare you try and buy that? Because his motive was completely wrong. He'd seen the gift and wanted some of that, but Peter said, whoa, 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 you have no idea what you're talking about. The gifts aren't for you to go and say, look what I can do. It's for the body and for what that's about. So before you seek any gift, check your heart and seek God and seek the giver. Let's just put some music on before I start. You don't need to come up, Kelly. I'm only going to be two minutes, so it's, it's fine. So we need to see the gifts operating. I'm more passionate about that than I've ever been before. But we need to use wisdom incredibly wisely as well with each of these gifts. You see, what's fascinating is where these words lie in Paul's writing. If you imagine Paul's written this letter to Corinth, the Corinthians, it's massively important. But remember, it's a letter. He didn't write it with chapters and verses. It's one big letter 
letter that he sent out. And in chapter 12, we have this moment where there's gifts of the Spirit, and he talks about the body of Christ, how it's going to work together. Then in chapter 14, he talks about how wisely we need to use those gifts, and and we make sure we don't use them wrongly. But then right in the middle, there's this chapter that everyone loves, and we sometimes forget where it is, in chapter 13, where he talks about love. He talks about love. And we so often pull this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, we pull it out of its context and we say things and it it works out of its context. But it's so important to grasp where this is in Paul's writing. Between this moment of gifts and church and body, between this moment of things not quite being right in the church and how we can do things well, is this beautiful, beautiful chapter where Paul begins to say, love is patient, love is kind, search after these things. That's no coincidence. Paul knows that our motive motivation for looking for gifts, for looking for the things of the Holy Spirit, for looking at everything else. Our motivation has to be pure. It has to be love. It has to be the body of Christ that he came and he died for. It has to be that because otherwise we're in an awful state if we're looking for anything else. And as ever, Paul sums it up amazingly in just one verse. Chapter 14, verse 1 says this. Let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. Today we can look, and you might have come here today thinking, oh, John is going to explain a few things about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, have just, I know I haven't had time to do really any of that. But let me tell you, your motivation has to be love. The thing that drives you to look for anything that God, Holy Spirit, he has for you, it has to be love. Don't go looking at anything else. Certainly don't look for power. Don't look for influence. Don't look for any of that. Look for love. Let love drive you. And then you will see the gifts operating. Then we'll see the real thing. Then we'll see New Testament Church of God happening in Utoxita when our motivation for all of this stuff is love, love, love. You see, the second part of this verse says, But you should desire the special abilities that the Spirit gives. He says you should desire it. He's not saying don't do, but make sure your motivation, your purpose for it all is pure and it's love. Let's just close our eyes for a minute as we pray. Awesome God. Awesome God. Let's just stand to our feet for a minute. In fact, if we can do that, that would be great. Jesus. We're not going to enter a great time of praise and worship right now. We're going to pray for you in a minute. If you want that, we're going to do that. It's not going to be an emotional time. We're not going to try and call you out to a new place. Because I want to, all I want you to do right now is check your motivation. Are you motivated by love? Is love your highest goal? How do we know love? Jesus Christ laid his life down on a cross for you, for his body, so that the Holy Spirit could dwell in you. So check your heart right now. Check your motive right now. Maybe you've been haunting and searching and desiring gifts, and and that's a good thing. Paul tells us it's a good, we should desire them. But just in this moment, what God would say is, what's your motivation? Why? Why do you want those? I'm more desperate than ever for God to show his gifts and let's see the gifts working in the body of Christ. But at work, it's got to be motivated by love. Love, love, love. Love. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, right now in this place, as you begin to move Holy Spirit, through our lives. Inspire us by love, God. Let your love inspire us that we don't just see your spirit moving around, 
but your love inside us lets Holy Spirit come and touch those painful areas in our lives that actually, before we see that flowing out, the love for you lets him touch those incredibly painful areas in our lives. That loves you too much just to leave it there and say, what are you going to do about this? All right now, every single one of us in this place will probably have something that Holy Spirit has been working inside of us. Maybe poking at gently, maybe trying to shove and say, this, this can't exist in here with me. But lovingly is saying, just, just take it out. And as love consumes you, then the overflow, the beautiful overflow. Who knows what we'll see? Who knows what we'll see? So God, inspire us by love, we pray. Inspire us with your love, I pray. May our motivation always be love. Even in the hard things, even in the tough times, even in those moments, Lord Jesus, where decisions don't always look like love, yet actually your love can be working through us. So help us, awesome God, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to open up if you've got anything that's in your other. We're not in a rush. I don't want you to suddenly sort of lose where, where we're at right now. Holy Spirit wants to work. And as our team come out, they'll be out at the front. Whatever there is in you, if you want healing for the things like uh, ransom has asked for, come to the front. If you're desiring a gift, if you're desiring something, just, just come and use the front. We've got this time. There's no rush. We're not racing away. And so just come, and our team will come, and they'll pray for you. Uh, and just make the most of that, this space today. It's, it's not about feeling things in the air. It's about knowing God doing something inside of you. And so if that's you, you can just come out. And otherwise, if you want to go have a coffee, that's fantastic as well. There's no rush. There's no race. But just, the, just right now, we just, I'll just send you with God's blessing on your life every single way. If you've got to go now, fantastic. You can do that. But if you want prayer, just come to the front as well. Have a great, awesome week. May God bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you this week. Thank you, Lord. Amen.